Hi, I'm Bob Gimlin. I want to take some time to discuss how primates, like Bigfoot or Bigfoot's predecessors, found their way to North America, why they evolved and adapted so radically different from the known great apes, and what that means for Bigfoot's behavior. A few million years ago, lasting until just about 10,000 years ago, planet Earth was in an on and off state of quaternary glaciation, also known as the Ice Ages. You know how ice cubes float to the top of a glass of water? The same is true for this planet. The more water that is frozen above sea level in the form of glaciers, the less water is in the oceans. Today, this is where Russia meets Alaska. But during the Ice Ages, when water was frozen above sea level in the form of glaciers, the sea level would drop. This drop in water level made way for the Bering Land Bridge, also known as Beringia, which during the summer would have been incredibly fertile from the retreating ocean. During these Ice Ages, Many species found in Asia, Europe, and Africa migrated to North America, and vice versa. Two examples of animals that evolved in North America and migrated to Asia are the camelids and equids. But what about the other way around? During the mass transcontinental migrations via Beringia, animals traveling from Africa, Asia, and Europe to North America had a tendency to get bigger, badder, and stranger. And as they say, you're only as good as the company you keep. This is Moertherium. These remains were found in Asia. It filled the niche of the hippopotamus today. Moertherium was like a taper, on steroids. A population of these creatures began migrating across Beringia, at which point the new and relatively uncompetitive environment allowed them to grow to look more like this, Gomphothere, and the most famous of the prehistoric Proboscidae, the American Mastodon. And these weren't the only herbivores who traveled across Beringia and became massive. The steppes bison, which is actually the direct descendant of the modern cow, seen here depicted in the 15,000-year-old cave paintings from France and Spain, migrated across Beringia to become the broad-headed paleobison, or giant North American Ice Age bison, the largest ever of its kind. The warthog, like Parentelodon, of Asia and Africa, crossed over to North America, and the massive surplus of land to roam and graze allowed them to grow into Entelodon which were basically 900-pound eating machines. And of course, with the prey came the predators, who had to grow to match their growing prey. This is the African lion. It has changed surprisingly little in the past few million years, but the species changed dramatically when a population of them crossed into North America, wherein it became the American lion. The surplus of space, as well as exponentially higher resources, allowed them to grow. An enormous African lion is about 400 pounds, the American lion was about 800 pounds. Not to be confused with the saber-toothed cats, who were in North America long ago. They are their own family, and they actually didn't do too well as a species at all. Probably why we haven't seen those traits anywhere else before or ever again. Lions didn't come alone. Hyena ancestors came as well. And they grew to be truly horrendous. African hyena exploded once in East Asia and subsequently North America into Hyena de Horridus, a 130-pound pack-hunting super-predator whose bite force put that of the modern gray wolf and prehistoric dire wolf's bite force to shame. And then we see Hyenidae gigas, who at over 1,000 pounds was almost the size of a modern rhinoceros. And of course, a subspecies of the relatively small spectacled bear, once crossing into North America through Beringia, became one of the largest land-based predators to live since the dinosaurs. The short-faced bear... Widespread throughout the continent, the short-faced bear stood about 12 feet tall, dwarfing the native brown, Kodiak, and grizzly bears to the area. Moertherium, the steppes bison, Parentelodon, the African lion, hyena, the spectacled bear, all monsters in their own right, became truly monstrous once in the fertile and uncompetitive environment of North America. This new world, selected for larger bodies and larger populations, because the new environment could support growth. It is not only possible, but likely, that at least one primate, perhaps Gigantopithecus, perhaps Triopithecus, or perhaps as of yet unknown, followed so many other animals to North America. And if this could turn into this, and this, into this, and this into this, then it is not only reasonable, but probable, that something like this would turn into something like this. What I'm trying to say in so many words is that there is huge precedent, a lot of precedent, 
for exotic animals to have come to North America and then change in ways never seen before or since. It wouldn't be the first time this happened to a primate. Millions of years ago, a primate or primate ancestor became isolated on the island of Madagascar and would become the genus known as lemur. In their new habitat, the lemur grew enormous, like this giant lemur, who was 350 pounds and went extinct less than 2,000 years ago. This is a giant ape that was thriving during the Roman Empire. The giant lemur enjoyed an environment with no predators, so it could be large, and carelessly graze all day, like a cow. Unlike Bigfoot, who had to contend with all manner of nightmarish creatures. Bigfoot had to be fast, sleek, and quick-thinking. How Bigfoot got to North America, as well as the company Bigfoot lived among, explains an awful lot about Bigfoot behavior. We tend to think of Bigfoot as the apex predator or top of the food chain, perhaps only challenged by the Kodiak or grizzly bear. However, this does not represent the traits of Bigfoot. Bigfoot is an animal that hides and runs and flees, and screams to scare, and throws rocks to avoid violence. If Bigfoot was always king of his domain, I imagine it would be a much more assertive creature. But in the past few million years, up until only a few thousand years ago, Bigfoot had much to fear. A drove of Entelodon would make short work of a troop of Bigfoot, as would a stampede of threatened Mastodon, or a pride of 800-pound American lion who preyed on Entelodon and Mastodon. All of these things would have been a significant threat to Bigfoot. Hell, even a family of Castroidus, a 200-pound, 9-foot-long beaver with 9-inch-long incisors, seen here next to today's beaver, would have been enough to make a Bigfoot think twice before crossing a river all of which went extinct less than 10,000 years ago. The extinction of the megafauna of North America is largely attributed to Clovis Man, which is a mysterious culture that is hallmarked by their highly efficient killing technology. Clovis Man, as indicated by their arsenals, knew damn well that there is no such thing as safety until every last one of these things was exterminated. I don't care how big your fire was, how deep into a cave you were hiding, or how strong your shelter was. If this thing wanted in, it was going to get in. Remember that next time you're having a bad day. But Bigfoot managed to elude Clovis Man, because it already had to be so very good at hiding, due to the monsters it had to contend with. There is a reason that Bigfoot are good at hiding, because until very recently, they had a lot to hide from, and that is why they are so good at remaining hidden. Their survival depends on it. Now, as it did then. All in all, there is great precedent for exotic animals to come from far away, to North America, and then adopt survival strategies. This is one of those animals, and its survival strategy, hiding, works even better today than it did then. But that is just my opinion. Like and subscribe if you'd like to hear more, and thanks an awful lot for listening.